Hello, Daniel. Hi, Frank. Uh, thanks for making the time to, to talk to me about, about very important news, and you, you'll explain uh, me why in, in a little bit. Um, we have followed, um, you have followed as a lawyer, um, Israel's um, aggression in Gaza that has turned very quickly into what many people have called a, a, a genocide. Um, I remember actually watching a video you made, I think, for maybe Palestine Deep Dive, uh, where, which was a few weeks ago, uh, where you mentioned that it, you, know, you needed one state to take on uh, this question of genocide to the ICJ to, to unlock the, the, pro the proceedings in a way. And, uh, yeah. and about, I can't remember now, about what, four or five days ago now? Yeah, 28th, 29th of December, yeah. It was announced that South Africa, um, you know, launched a claim at the ICJ against Israel. So yeah. without, you know, uh, dragging on, I, I wanted to ask you, what, what is this claim, especially? What is it? Yes, so I think it's important to put um, this in a little of broader context first. So let me just a answer the question you didn't ask me, which is how this fits into international legal architecture, because I think some people have a confusion between the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. And in fact, in some of the early reports, including in the Israeli media, they confused the two. So the International Court of Justice is part of the UN legal architecture and is very long standing. Its predecessor under the League of Nations and it's existed for many, many years, decades. Um, and it is the it's the world court. It's the court where states uh, fight out legal disputes between each other, where issues of public international law are fought out. Continental shelf cases, border disputes, all kinds of disputes. And in many treaties, international treaties, it will say that the International Court of Justice is the appropriate court to determine legal disputes arising under those treaties. And the Genocide Convention has those very provisions in it. That is entirely separate from the International Criminal Court, which is there. Basically, there was a failure of consensus after the Second World War, after the various international treaties, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Genocide Convention, Geneva Conventions, a breakdown in, in the consensus about creating an international criminal court then and there. And what happened is following the terrible events in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, the Security Council had to set up ad hoc international cri criminal tribunals. And it finally, those events and those tribunals broke broke open the debate and created uh, a lot of momentum for there to be a permanent international criminal court. That led to the Rome Statute, and that is outside the UN architecture. It's a separate system for dealing with international criminal cases, and that came into being when enough states had ratified the Rome Statute. So that's been in existence for about, in operating actually for about two decades, as opposed to the much longer established International Court of Justice. So that needs to be separated out. The role of the International Criminal Court is to prosecute individuals for international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. Um, and it, it's important to bear in mind that it has had active, active jurisdiction following a series of decisions on Palestine and Israel because Palestine ratified the Rome Statute and then referred itself, but it took many years for that to have jurisdiction, and that it acquired following a series of decisions in 2021. So by the time the current chief prosecutor, Kareem Khan, KC, UK barrister, was appointed to that role, there was an active investigation into Palestine and Israel. Coming back to your actual question. So what the South African government has done as the Gambia did in relation to Myanmar and the treatment of the Rohingyas by the Myanmar government, is it said to the state of Israel, we have stated with you since the beginning of the Gaza conflict and our concerns that a genocide was being committed. There was a risk of genocide. And now we have seen 
following a series of communications we had with you, including most recently a week before they filed their case, they sent them a note verbal, but they'd already been coming back to the International Criminal Court with four other states. They had sent a communication requiring the prosecutor to investigate concerns about war crimes, crimes against humanity in the current conflict. So they said, they've said in this, in this application to the court, there's a crystallized dispute between us about your failure to comply with your obligations under the Genocide Convention. And because we have a positive duty, actually, to make sure that such a key plank of international law is upheld, we have acted under our duty, which is what's called an erga omnes duty, uh, to, to enforce a jus cogens, a kind of globally um, required compliance with fundamental legal standards, which is where there's a risk of genocide to prevent it, where there is incitement to commit genocide, that that is suppressed through legal means, prosecutions of those who incite genocide. And you, Israel, are committing genocide and are failing to suppress incitement to commit genocide. You have failed in all these specific regards under your duties that are spelt out in the Genocide Convention. And they've gone further than that. They've said, not only have you done all of this, but we need to take positive steps. The court needs to take positive steps to take preventative measures and enforce, uh, uh, announce an injunction, uh, an interim order here called uh, preventative measures, because the risk to the Palestinian life, and I'm talking about Palestinian life, lives, but also the whole of the Palestinian life in the Gaza Strip, there is such a risk to the existence of the Palestinian people in Gaza. If, if this doesn't happen, because of the acts that Israel is undertaking, that you, the court, should require Israel to stop its military operations and um, create the, the necessary um, conditions for Palestinians to be able to return to their homes and, of course, to be fed and for medical supplies to reach them properly. And that can only happen through a ceasefire. So there'll can be I a hearing. You, can I Sorry, can I ask you specific, specifically about this? Because so South Africa has especially requested that the ICJ move urgently to prevent Israel from committing further crimes in the strip. In the strip, yeah. sorry, that's what you just said. Um, the ICJ said that this request will be prioritized. Yes, so, and they've announced just today, in the last okay. few hours. Um, you can see it's a press release issued by the International Court of Justice within the last four hours. Okay. Uh, today, 3rd of uh, January, they've announced they're going to be uh, hearing on the 11th of January, next Thursday, the case in the morning, South Africa will present the case for preventative measures. The following morning, Friday the 12th of January, the court will hear back from Israel. And Israel has announced in the last few days uh, that it will participate in the proceedings. Uh, we don't know any details about their legal team as yet, uh, but we do know that they they intend to respond to the South African application. Um, I anticipate, based on previous such cases, including um, preventative measures under the Genocide Convention, you can ask for preventative measures in other circumstances as well, but based on those, I would hope that there will be a, a, um, a ruling in January. So that, that's quite extraordinary in a way. So a ruling in January from the ICJ potentially saying to Israel, you need to stop, right? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Can I, so there's so many questions in a way surrounding that because the, the proceedings are, are they binding or non-binding first? So that is- They're Israel... entirely binding. Okay. Again, there's been a statement within the last couple of hours um, of um, the Israeli government indicating that it might not comply with the rule the ruling. Uh, it's very, very strange announcement. It needs to be, we need to see what they say in the next few days. So while they're attending, there's already some 
very uh, troubling messaging around um, their attendance and of course their immediate response of of uh, what I think is reasonable to call a knee-jerk response by accusing South Africa of committing a blood libel against Israel and accusing it also of supporting Hamas. I mean, the very first paragraph, paragraph one of their application, and I will read it to you because it's within a couple of sentences. So this, these are the Israelis speaking about this case without clearly having even read paragraph one or addressing the world as if it didn't say this in paragraph one. South Africa unequivocally condemns all violations of international law by all parties, including the direct targeting of Israeli civilians and other nationals and hostage taking by Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups. So they couldn't be clearer. This is not a claim brought by South Africa in support of Hamas. And it's critical, I think, absolutely correctly as an international law process of the actions of Hamas. And those, by the way, can and should be judged as part of proceedings at the International Criminal Court. And it's only because the Palestinians invited the court to take jurisdiction in the teeth of opposition by Israel that that is, that is in fact possible and, in my view, should happen. So those responses yeah. need to be set aside and they won't get them anywhere at the court. They will have to address the elements. And the elements are the intent behind index offences. So there are, there are a list of index offences, including killings and um, serious harm to a population. And there is a longer list, and it's all dealt with in the application that South Africa put down. And they've listed sort of eight or nine headings of, if you like, index offences. So those are the index offences. They're a narrower group than all the potential war crimes that could be a state could commit. Um, and they are a narrower group than all the possible crimes against humanity. They don't, for example, include crimes against humanity such as apartheid. So the small list of offences have to be done with the intent to destroy part or whole of a national ethnical religious, racial group. And here the group in question are the Palestinian people and the Palestinians living in Gaza. And the, the risk to the Palestinians living in Gaza is so clear to people who have collected evidence and who have spoken out and, and identified all of those risks that I believe that the, the underlying factual basis for saying these crimes have been committed and the statements of intent by leading Israeli politicians are clear. Today, as well, Frank, it was published that before the, le the case was issued in South Africa, a group of prominent Israelis um, wrote a letter uh, with the assistance of um, a prominent human rights lawyer in Israel, Michael Sfard, to the Israeli authorities listing all of the, or some of the, I haven't seen an English translation yet of the letter, but it's an 11 page letter to the to the public authorities in Israel saying, what are you doing to deal with all of these incitements to commit genocide? Where are you complying with your local obligations, which are from the genocide convention? So every country that there are 153 state parties, every state party has to put in place criminal laws to suppress, criminalize incitement to commit genocide. And Israel has a positive duty, which is pointed out in the application to the International Court of Justice to deal with and suppress incitement to commit genocide. And these acts of incitement have been going on, I believe, both before the 7th of October, but the scale of the calls for eradicating Gaza, indistinguishing, being clear that they do not distinguish between Hamas suspects and civilians, and that all of them need to be, or a vast proportion of them need to be destroyed. The serial destruction of the whole of North Gaza, 
which is continuing and which there are videos of Israeli soldiers repeatedly filming themselves and um, making it clear that they seek the destruction and the settlement of those areas and the displacement of Palestinians, um, not just internally, but outside of Gaza. So um, the evidence seems to me to be compelling and we will now see whether or not the court is prepared. Yeah. I, I, you wanted to want say to, go, go. I go. want to add one thing about the threshold, Frank, for these preventative measures. It's not the role now of the International Court of Justice to determine whether a genocide actually has been committed. It's whether there is a plausible basis in the evidence prevent, presented to it that that has happened. And then if there is a plausible basis, is there a risk that if the court doesn't act in the face of the evidence, that there is a palpable risk to the lives and the life of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip? That's the, the key issues they will be presented with. Not have you proven the case, have you got a plausible argument? And then are we required by the existence of the facts that we have determined or that we've been presented with if we haven't determined them um, to require Israel to stop or to take any other preventative measures. And by the way, South Africa has presented a list of preventative measures in its application. It can seek an amendment or change them. And the court can obviously act off its own back in certain circumstances to, um, to announce its own preventative measures. Can I ask you something else? Because in a way, such a statement by the, the ICJ, could it stop the war? Or could Israel say, we're pulling some troops out, we're letting humanitarian aid flow a bit more, uh, so the risk of genocide is lesser, but we're continuing the war? Yes, I mean, there is, of course, there are all, no, the, the permutations in terms of full compliance with, unequivocal and full compliance with the order and 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 uh, some halfway house or quarterway house are endless. Um, full compliance, we will know what that looks like. Um, a proper ceasefire, um, hopefully leading, of course, to the release of all the hostages, etc. I mean, again, no one should be defending the taking of civilians as hostages. Um, and obviously, it, as a matter of law, I want to see those and morality. I want to see those brought to an end. But I absolutely clear that the 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 urgent risk at the moment, given the reports we have about the percentage of um, Palestinians in different parts of Gaza who face the risk literally of starvation, the risk of disease which is now spreading because of the unsanitary conditions that so many hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who've lost their homes have now been living in the most abject conditions uh, with winter coming, winter arriving in fact, um, you know, th th there is a palpable immediate risk to a very significant number of Palestinians and who are being severely harmed of course, as the application. And by the way, I, I urge everyone that's watching or listening to this uh, interview to read the key paragraphs, the, the paragraphs that set out the index offences and the paragraphs that set out the intent, the statements of intent um, to commit the genocide. Because it will be an important education for yeah. those, even those that have followed the news or followed your interviews with others, will learn and A be lot, shocked, yeah. shocked. I mean, I thought I knew a lot and had followed a lot. And obviously you have, and, and those that um, watch your interviews, I'm sure have done, but they won't know some of the details that are in here, in my view, they will be positively shocked. And it's absolutely imperative now for anyone who has any sense of the rule of law being something that oppressed people can actually call upon. And remember, we, these are all long, long fought for fight, uh, rights. Um, you know, it used to be the case that states could just continue 
to conduct their affairs without individual citizens effectively having rights or for one state to vindicate the rights of other citizens as South Africa is seeking to do. All of that, these, these didn't just happen. These are hard fought for fight rights, which must mean something. Why, why did we fight so long? Why did our forebears fight so long for such rights to exist if they're not going to be enforced in practice? Um, there's a reason for all this, a historic reason. And what is left if you can't turn to the rule of law to address, to help resolve uh, disputes in a peaceful manner? Then it's just might is right. And I think the the disservice that the Palestinians have been served is a disservice to the whole of humanity that we haven't had an, a proper equality before the law, an application of the rule of law. And this is a decisive moment, in my view, in the international legal order, because the UN architecture has failed so far. The UN Security Council, in so many instances, including, by the way, Russia, because it holds this veto power at the Security Council. And so the International Court of Justice has the opportunity um, to look at this seriously and to see whether it can take action. And as I say, it will have legal ripples. Um, and one of the things it may do is force the hand of the Security Council, force the hand of the United States. If it is serious in complying with its international legal obligations, um, any state that's been supporting and arming what the ICJ would call a real risk of, of genocide if they reach that conclusion will have to be affected. And the legal case, for example, that the Center for Constitutional Rights on behalf of Palestinian applicants has taken against the Biden administration will be transformed by, in my view, they need to speak to the lawyers from the Center for Constitutional Rights as to the specific way it will impact that litigation. But I would I would bet my I bet some money on it having a direct impact on their litigation if there is a, a ruling for preventative measures. Thanks, Daniel. I wanted to end with two questions into, into one. Um, can more countries actually join the claim made by South Africa? And what's the role of civil society? Can civil society do anything to put pressure on, on the court? In the next, I'm, I'm quite urgently, I guess, because it's, yes. it's happening now. I, I, I can answer those questions, I hope, I hope, quite briefly. In the longer run, states can intervene. It wouldn't make any sense for a state to formally intervene between now and the hearings next week. It's just not necessary. And, and we don't, it would face, it would actually risk slowing things down. But statements already made in the last few days by Turkey and by Malaysia. Many more states, all the states certainly that have um, already made state, announced their concern about the risk of genocide. Obviously, I think all 153 state parties to the Genocide Convention should be, um, other than Israel, so 152, should be saying, we support this case and we support, definitely support the request for preventative measures. They could support the request for preventative measures without supporting the actual case in the long run, because the point of this whole litigation and the point of the duty, though it, we are late, because in my view, genocide is taking place, but it's it's the duty to prevent and punish. So great if states um, make it clear, as Malaysia and uh, Turkey have in, in the last couple of days, that they support South Africa's application and the organization for islamic of islamic countries has also done that but individual states from that organization should state their support and send letters of support to the international court now civil society of course have a role in making that happen organizations across the world when they when they go out on the streets in the next few days when they write letters to their members of their their parliamentary system um when they lobby parliaments when they speak out, they need to point to the details in this incredible application that these series of acts, which appear to be calculated to destroy Palestinian life in the Gaza Strip, 
are taking place and that the express intent, the speeches made by Netanyahu going back to October and the defense minister, those need to be publicized again and again. Those are not, no, they didn't hide their intention. They stated their intention. Now, a last point on this. One of the sinister things in my view, given the way these public statements were made and the, the repetition of them by senior politicians, is that they haven't been called out as such by enough states. Only the list of states that's in the South African application have actually called out these statements. Leading Western countries, the United States, Canada, they have not said, you cannot make these genocidal statements, you need to retract them. I'm afraid that this is not an accident. They are, they've heard these statements just as you and I have. They have been aware that the minute they start to call out these statements and require their attraction, you could say they've identified the risk of a genocide and they need to take the positive steps that South Africa has, has taken to go to court. But that's not a good reason. They need to be called out. There is no good reason to call out what these Israeli politicians have been saying. Not a single good reason. And they need to be told, you have to call these statements out. You have to require Israeli politicians, the leading politicians that have said all these things since October, you have to tell them, retract them and publicly announce that you will not be committing these acts and then stop those acts. And that's a big ask, but it's absolutely clear that that's the legal duty on states. Um, and civil society has a role in publicizing it and calling on their politicians to do the right thing, comply with their legal obligations. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I was going to say it's very exciting in a way, but it, it's not because I wish, you know, this, you know, won't have happened. But um, because we could have some, some, you know, answers in a way in the very short term, um, I think it's, it's quite exciting because it could put actually a lot of pressure on, on, on Israel. And um, actually, a quick question. Israel was actually in a way, in the dock at the ICJ in 2004, and now yes. in 2023. Is that the... But they weren't the binding. The, the, the yeah. thing is, while the advisory opinion stated persuasively yeah. the, the public international law around the wall and around the rights of Palestinians to achieve self-determination, all yeah. very important, it was an advisory opinion. Uh, yeah. It's not the... This is... Okay are more straightforwardly binding at an international law level. Now, there are debates about what the status of an advisory opinion is and what, when it states the law unequivocally and authoritatively, what that should mean for domestic systems. But there are no such concerns with, the debate doesn't exist. This will be an authoritative statement at the point of preventative measures about the threshold and whether or not it's been met, and as I said, the order, whatever order it issues, and I hope it will issue an order for preventative measures, will be binding and will have that international ripple in, in, the, in the legal order of um, many states, um, all the states party to the Genocide Convention. Thanks, Good. Daniel. All right. Uh, good luck with everything.